All right, so as we're waiting, I'm actually going to talk a little bit about PhotoWorks and some of the things that we have going on. Um, we just released a whole new schedule of spring and summer classes. I will share my screen and show you briefly uh, what the what the registration process looks like. So you can come down here, view the full list of classes. Some of these have passed now, unfortunately, um, but we have classes up until August. So if you're in the mood for workshops or specific classes that um, help your photography skills, or classes that help uh, kind of like content driven stuff, we have it <laughs> and we'd love to see you. Um, another thing, some of you might know that we have open darkroom um, hours on Sundays. Here's a good picture. We have um, a traditional darkroom lab and a digital lab and we're open on Sundays from one to seven and would love to see you there. So just some highlights. And I'm sure most of you know this, but the reception for this exhibition is this Saturday from four to 6 p.m. Um, we had to cancel last weekends because of the unfortunate winter weather, <laughs> but we're excited to see everybody and uh, have hopefully a warmer time. <laughs> but that will be from four to six on Saturday. And it's 7.05. So I think we're gonna go ahead and I'll let people in um, as we keep going, but let's go ahead and start. So, this is one of three exhibits that Iwan Begus has um, uh, curated. And it's kind of been a long time coming. We were just discussing this, that uh, Iwan started looking at people's um, uh, pro propositions for um, gallery exhibits in 2019. And it is now 2022. <laughs> and we had the first show um, in 2020 in January, but we are now closing closing that the third show and, and we're in 2022. So um, both Phil and Jennifer have had to wait a pretty long time to actually put this work up on the walls. And uh, we're just all very excited to have it finally. So. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our curator, Iwan. He started his career off as a model in Indonesia and became a photographer. He has shown work um, at the National Geographic Society, the Corcoran Washington Performing Arts Society, the Carnegie Institute, and many other places. Um, he is currently the head of photography at UDC, and he also is a lecturer at American University. And like I said, uh, he curated some of the other exhibits um, before this. So with Yuri Long and John Malice, and also with Steven Greenberg and David Sherbel. So thank you, Iwan, for being here and for curating these great exhibits. Oh, uh, thank you, Sophie. So hello, everyone. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, again, my name is Iwan. I'm originally from Jakarta, Indonesia, and I've been living in DC for 27 years. Um, as Sophie mentioned, I'm a photographer and a photography professor at the University of the District of Columbia and also a professorial lecturer at American University. Um, just additional thing, I'm a Pisces. Uh, <laughs> First of all, I would like to thank uh, Glenn Echo Photo Works, um, especially Gail Rothschild and Sophie McDonald and all the staffs and the artists Jennifer Sakai and Philip Taplin and everyone who submitted the portfolio. 
Uh, it has been an honor to serve as the juror in 2019 and the curator for the first two artists in 2020, the curator at the end of 2021, and for the show spring 2022. So it's been a long process, but it's been a wonderful process because uh, we started, I started looking uh, more than 30 plus wonderful artists who in uh, who submitted the work in 2019, and it was quite challenging for me to, se to select only six. So as I review the portfolios, what is important to me is the thematic consistency and inspiring narratives. Um, so both artists uh, here, Jennifer and Phil, in this exhibit exquisitely present their images through photography as the medium. Uh, Jennifer's work is a documentation of a surface of memory in Isser, Long Island. And she's been working on this uh, for the past 15 years, specifically about this work. And Phil's work is a documentation and celebration iconic American architecture in the mid 20th century of America. So uh, when I look at both of their works during the jury process, um, I found there's something similar, something that actually moves me is um, there are a few words that I've found is something that's romantic, nostalgic, and melancholic in this series of visual narratives. So, and um, I started uh, visualizing what, you know, during the exhibition, although this was in 2019, how I would like to see these two works together. And so, a few months ago, I had the opportunities to see the prints that they brought, and it was wonderful. Um, so, again, thank you. Um, and also, I hope everyone is having a wonderful time uh, um, and enjoying this beautiful artworks later on that uh, uh, Jennifer and Phil are going to show. Congratulations again to all the artists. Um, again, I would like to say it's been such an honor, a pleasure to be the juror and the curator for uh, this portfolio series. And I hope to see you all this Saturday. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you Yuan. Uh, beautiful. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce a little bit more um, Jennifer and Phil, though. Iwan just did a great job of that, um, so thank you. Uh, Jennifer is a fine art photographer, curator, and professor here in DC. She has taught at the Park School of Communication in Ithaca. She's taught at VCU um, and the Corcoran School of Art and Design, GW University, and um, American University. Um, she is currently um, the a lecturer at the MFA program in American University and is curating a photography exhibit at the Katzen Museum, which will open this summer in 2022. She's also a multi multiple recipient of a DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities grant for her photographic process or practice. Um, and Jennifer, I believe you said you've been working on this body of art for 15 or so years. This and is my largest, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, so it also, um, you've also talked about just how um, your artistic practice like examines a long scale kind of relationship with landscape and um, and the years and time has a lot to do with that. So that's that's Jennifer. And then with Phil Taplin, um, he is a longtime fine art photographer and resident of DC. His work focuses on commercial roadside architecture of the mid 20th century. Um, his work has been exhibited at numerous galleries and he has received regional and national awards. Um, Phil earned his master's degree in photojournalism from the University of Minnesota. And um, he has also been through a lot of training workshops um, through the main photographic workshops, Santa Fe workshops, 
um, and some other great photography organizations. So we're so excited to have you both here today and excited to get into your work. Um, Jennifer, do you want to go ahead and, and share Sophie, your screen? Sophie, can I just wait, wait, before you do that, I just want to um, interject something. We will be doing this work was selected by our juror uh, that was this year or well 2019 juror. Um, we will be having another call for proposal, uh, which is what this work came from, uh, probably the end of the summer. And it requires you to submit a whole portfolio and we will have a different juror that will select people to have an exhibit at photo work. So keep an eye out for it. We haven't put out with everything being so crazy, we haven't really put out the call yet for the upcoming shows, but it'll be close to the fall. So, okay, I'm done. Thank oh, you. Thanks, Gail. So I'm gonna hand the mic over to Jennifer if you'd like to go into your work. Um, just to preface, um, both Jennifer and Phil have um, created a presentation to share with us tonight and we'll go through their work and um, screen share. So um, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to put the questions in the chat and we'll have time at the end to ask the artist those questions and have a little conversation at the end. So thanks. Okay, thank you, Sophie and Gail and Iwan. I'm gonna try and um, share my screen and then Sophie, just let me know if everything yep. works. Okay, fabulous. Okay, um, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about this body of work and some of the starting points. <clears throat> it's all taken um, and comprised of landscape and surface in Eastern Long Island, which I didn't go to until I was an adult. It was a topography that was um, new to me or foreign to me. And when I started to look around and uh, look for inspiration and, and sort of what I was interested in, I searched and you know, really looked back to some other artists who had worked in this location, um, starting with the painter William Merritt Chase, who's known for his plein air paintings um, and for starting the Shinnecock School of Painting. And I realized that a lot of the surfaces and uh, images that he had really were timeless and they, they hadn't really changed that much um, in, in all of those years. I also became deeply enamored with the painter Fairfield Porter, who is known for spending a great deal of uh, his career out on the Eastern end of Long Island. And what appealed to me is uh, both the light and um, the way that he broke up space, but also the recording of the topography. Um, the fact that I can drive along old Montauk Highway and it, it looks very much the same uh, here as it does now. Um, so I, studying a, a lot of his work, then I sort of circled back around and was interested in, in finding and composing things that had a lot of similar principles uh, in the images. It's also greatly influenced by the painter Jane Wilson, the American painter, originally from Iowa, who moved to New York uh, as a young artist. And primarily, I would say I, I do look a lot at paintings um, as much, if not more, than photographers. Uh, something about the way they use color, as I'm a color photographer primarily, um, and the way that they show light in color. So. Uh, she also had a studio in Watermill out on Eastern Long Island and had a lot of her practice. Um, she sort of ended up going back and forth between uh, New York City and this Watermill studio. But you know, I was looking at her again to, for the atmosphere, um, for the luminous way that she sort of captured sea and land and sky. Um, and, and integrating that into my own images and looking around what was this new territory for me um, and really trying to capture the essence of, of some of the same things um, that I feel like these painters were, were showing. And there's a reason that the, 
the light is so um, famous out on Eastern Long Island. It was something about the quality of the air and the light, which really enchanted me and was the impetus of really starting this series out there, which has been um, 15 years now that I've been working on it. This is actually my, uh, my longest series, um, but looking around uh, the landscape is really was the beginning um, of it all, of me sort of falling in love with a, a space and then, um, you know, making these notations and starting almost a, a journal or a memory um, in a visual way. So the origin of uh, the series, it's called Hillover Road, and this is the house that's on Hillover Road. It's on top of um, literally a hill in Shinnecock. Um, so like William Merritt Chase, same, the same area. And it's a really modest home that has um, you know, seen four generations pass through it. It's primarily now um, a, a three season home, but it was, uh, it used to be a, a full time house in the 50s. Um, and what I love about this, this house and this place is the way that the light works within it. Um, and then also the, the timelessness uh, of the area. So sort of starting it's sort of the, the central point to which the series then radiates outward. So things just seem to be sort of static and, and sort of eternal in this space. Not much has changed in the interior of the house uh, in many, many, many years. So in some ways, it just, it seems like we all sort of pass through the house, but the house is, is a character in its own right. This is on the very edge of uh, Long Island in Montauk. Um, and this is now, uh, I would say not gone, they redid it, but um, sort of one of the interesting things is, you know, during the, the taking of all of these photographs is how much the area has changed in the past 15 years. Um, it was much more of a fishing village out in Montauk when I started it and it's been developed and there's so much more that's going on there now, um, but it's been uh, kind of wonderful to capture these things which then sort of eroded away and, and that sort of also linked into this um, theme that I have with time and memory. Um, so this was one of the ones that, that was at the beginning and sort of changed and went away. This as well became something, uh, something else. And this is again out in Montauk um, in Long Island. So the, the light is you know, what I'm interested in is, you know, sort of both the luminous light and then both in, in this image, which is sort of this muted diffuse light. Um, and I have some around the Hillover home that's the same sort of light, but it's uh, the quality of, of the light and the air. So the home views, um, you know, have been captured uh, in repetition. So it's been, um, you know, spring, summer, fall, late fall. Uh, of recording both the interior and the exterior surrounding area of the home um, and sort of repeating shapes and repeating um, themes. So this was, this is in the home and this is out uh, in Long Island. I think there's another image I have of this one. Um, this is the second or third incarnation of this sort of weird indoor swimming area that has gone through sort of a few, a few different changes. This is the interior uh, of the house. And what I love about the home is um, that it has this sort of uh, eternal quality. So the, um, the rug, everything, you can tell there's a new stove, but, but this kitchen is very much the same as it was in the 50s. Um, and just sort of the quirkiness of the place. This is a, a trap door that you take a ladder down into the basement. And that's where the, the shower is actually in the, the basement. And so we, we all go up and down this sort of trap door, but um, there's something sort of wonderful in, in these colors and these patterns from another time. And as a color photographer, uh, you know, I was really drawn, drawn to these colors. This is again out on the island and, and the same sort of thing. So that quality of light coming into the kitchen. Um, this is a ferry that, that takes you across uh, the water. 
but just as the sun is fading, so you have sort of the juxtaposition of this beautiful um, purple light and pink light and the oncoming car and then the, the ferry sign, which one side of it had, had fallen off uh, and actually I think made for a better, better image uh, when I went back it was actually repaired and it, it wasn't quite the same. But that sort of, again, folds into this notion of, um, of time and of recording. This is back on the top of the hill. So again, sort of that muted light. And then this is out again in Montauk. And in the larger, um, you know, the larger view of the series, the, which shown in the PhotoWorks gallery for the show, is obviously the, the selection. It's a truncated version um, that Iwan has curated. But if you look at sort of the, the larger arch of the work, um, you'll see some of the same places repeated uh, and some of the same areas in different seasons. So you, you do feel this like passage of time. So, you know, I would also say, um, you know, mostly dependent upon viewing painters as inspiration. Um, but I will also say that, you know, I do love the work of Stephen Shore, um, Cape Light, that sort of thing for photo as well. Here's the same, um, this was 15 years earlier, this was the same indoor pool, um, but at a different incarnation. So it had sort of this yellow ceiling, yellow chairs. Uh, and this was in high summer as opposed to the other one was in winter. So, you know, always sort of key with the series is its location. There's some um, images that really tie to uh, not only where it is, but, but also um, All right. the, the land and um, these sort of the topography that you see over and over again that you associate with this seas seaside um, that, so you sort of orient yourself and you you know where you are. So like these, um, you know, middens of uh, clamshells and scallop shells that the fishermen leave, um, you know, really sort of are anchor you to a, a certain place, to knowing that you're on a coast, to knowing that you're a seaside, but again, still, with that really sort of luminous, beautiful light. One of the things that kept happening as I have started taking the series is, you know, going, going to the beach, spending a day walking along, and I started to notice um, these sort of bizarre structures which were on, uh, on the beach. And, you know, we would see them one time and then the tide would come in and, and they would, you know, they were very ephemeral. They would be gone 24 hours later. So I just started to record them. Um, and as with most things with me, I, I don't really set out with a, a series in mind. I just sort of start noticing patterns or, or things that are reoccurring and, and they kind of gel that way. And so over the course of 15 years, I have a, a great deal of these and um, I've incorporated them all into a grid of mini prints um, of anonymous sculpture. And they're just so fascinating to me because I think because of their ephemeral quality, um, I think you can see when you look at the, the series um, on the wall, you know, you, you can notice through the color of the sea and the sky that it's different times of year. Sometimes they look very wintry in terms of the coolness. Um, other times it's, you get the feeling of the warmth and you, that it's summer, um, but, you know, all of these obelisks are just so interesting when I find them on the beach. It's sort of a, a, a wild occurrence and, um, you know, always sort of taking them, it sort of added up to a really sort of large subset uh, within this larger body of work. So because the series has been going on for so long, I have ended up with these like smaller, little like mini addendums uh, within the larger Hillover umbrella. The Memory Motel, when you drive out to Montauk and you come into Montauk proper, there's a famous uh, Memory Motel and it sort of greets you uh, as you come into the town. And this was something else just like the, um, the sticks where I just, every time I came into town, I would pull over and, and take a photograph uh, in different seasons um, with the hedges being, you know, 
really high or really low. Um, and again, this was another group of images that ended up comprising into this sort of uh, grid and a calculation and a recording of this one space over time. It's sort of interesting. It's hard to tell perhaps in this smaller version online, but they did do some repairs and they actually moved the badging that says memory motel. You can see in the center one and the bottom left, that's actually the side. And so for a couple of years, there, there was not any badging the way you usually see it. The, the top middle and the one that I just showed you, they moved it back this year. So that was um, really wonderful to see. It wasn't quite the same when you came into town and you didn't see the memory motel. Um, so again, with even within um, the subset of both the, the areas when you leave the home and of the home, uh, I have these surfaces that have been recorded uh, in different seasons, again, uh, you know, over and over. So this is just a, a pair of some bleachers that's in Southampton, New York. And in different seasons, you can tell it's sort of fallow, there's sort of high summer, um, and then completely cleared. Um, so these sort of repetitions and themes with time and timelessness, um, again, these sort of supported the, the, the entire sort of Hillover series. This is a, a closed uh, drawing rack in the, in the front of the property. Um, and these are all different, uh, these years are actually spaced kind of far apart. Um, and as well, I have sort of the rack without clothes uh, in different seasons. The, the first person that gets to the home, uh, usually the grass is really, really high. So I have it like that. But again, it was, you know, really marking with ritual and with surface and um, with material, kind of the passing of time, but then how things really sort of stay the same. So that was really my interest um, with the series, with Hillover. Uh, it's really based in memory uh, and in history, personal and collective. So personal with this very specific um, unchanged home that's, you know, as much of a, of a character as, um, as you know, the rest of the, the topography out there. And then more general in terms of as you drive out the island and these sort of repeated views and spaces and light. Um, and I, you know, I was really excited to have Hillover be seen uh, as um, Gail and Yvonne were, were talking about. It's been, you know, it's been 2019 since this was supposed to be kind of out there. Um, and so, you know, I sort of, put a pause and um, continued on Hillover, but I thought I would just show a little bit of, of what I'm currently doing or what I've been working on during the pandemic. Um, when the pandemic started as, as with everyone and sheltering in place and not you know, having your movement very restricted, I started taking these um, daily photo walks, you know, hours at a time with my camera. It was sort of the one thing you could do. And then I would go home and sort of, you know, cherry pick the, the image that I liked the best for that day. And I would record it um, both in the distancing day or the day since the pandemic started or how many days it had been since the pandemic started. And then the distance it was from my house, um, my house being, you know, everyone's home being their, their, safe, their safe place. Um, and so then these, this series has started to um, just snowball and build since then, unlike the, the Hillover series is very much uh, more in the Eggleston, Stephen Shore, um, you know, way of seeing it in a very literal uh, focus. And when I started shooting one of my earlier series, which was called The Midway, um, in which I was using view camera and really changing the focus, um, I've always been really interested in this shallow depth of field and, and how we see and how our eyes choose to, um, you know, move around and in a picture plane and what we look at. And it felt right for, for this series to have it be that sort of um, shallow depth of field where you have this sensation where, you know, you're sort of trying to focus in on something and you know, kind of tying to sort of the confusion and uncertainty, especially of that, that first year of the pandemic. Um, but then also really, you know, the goal was to look in your own space in a new way 
So, um, you know, all being within probably a mile, two miles at most of my home, um, these were things I would walk by, would never have seen if the pandemic hadn't forced me to slow down and really look at what was around me because I wasn't, uh, you know, far away or out in the world as much um, as everyone wasn't, especially in the, in the early stages. So, uh, you know, both the recording, I feel like this is also connected into some of my series with Hillover and that it sort of all goes back to my interest in marking time um, and of recording things in a way. And it just, you know, it, again, it was very just organic the way that it, that it started. And then it just, before I realized it, it was sort of this really large body, um, body of work. Um, so you can tell the sort of difference with the with the point of view and sort of the the micro macro, um, but um, the the way of notating your space, um, you know, recording your territory, um, marking time, I think that's consistent within within both of the series. And then this was the this is the most recent one that I just took this past weekend. I went out because it was, you know, the official two year mark with the with the intent of really hoping to find a picture on that day. And so um, I came across this and to me it's sort of, you know, I'm not sure if it's if the series will continue on after the two year mark, um, but it, it to me sort of said everything about what the past two years has been it was both sort of this. Um, you know the fallowness of the tree behind and the branches, but sort of this rebirth and the color of yellow and of hope and remembrance. Um, so I think that all of these things really play into um, both Hillover uh, and this series in terms of my, my interest uh, photographically. I'm gonna stop my share here for you guys. And I'm back. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, basically that's, that's where I'm at. And I uh, hope you enjoyed looking at all the work and I'll turn it either back to Sophie or to Phil so you can enjoy um, Phil's photography next. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jennifer. That was a treat to be able to look at obviously this body of work, Hillover, but then to also see what you've been working on uh, these past two years. So thank you. And I think we'll move to you, Phil, and feel free to share your screen. I don't know if you're seeing my notes and having a little trouble, um, but I think we're okay. Yep. First, I'd like to thank Gail and Sophie and Iman for putting all this together. Um, as you've heard, COVID made it a long haul but we made it this far. What I'd like to do this evening is talk to you a little bit about the American roadside. Now mostly known for its franchised uniformity, it was in an earlier time home to uniquely shaped businesses that proclaimed their owner's individuality. And I'd like to quote a little piece from J.J. C. Andrews, who wrote The Well-Built Elephant. And he says, first man built the Trojan horse, then came the Colossus of Rhodes. Finally, after centuries of decline, the modern age was here. At first a trickle, then a stream, then a raging river of giant elephants, ducks, ice cream cones, igloos, boots, and hot dogs. These photographs of mine celebrate iconic American architecture, buildings in the shape of other things, things that represent or signify the products they sell, from seafood to work shoes. Their size and the visual appeal beckon motorists to stop take a second look and try out the product or service. They were first popularized in the 
1920s and 1930s. As cars became more affordable, as new roads and bridges were built, and as the five-day work week became standardized, giving rise to the weekend. And this let car-crazy Americans explore places they'd never been to before. And soon, iconic structures began competing for attention on newly busy highways, like the Lincoln Highway, the first coast-to-coast -coast road, and Route 66, the Mother Road. This type of architecture goes by several names, programmatic, mimetic, iconic, even novelty architecture. But I like to think of it as folk art writ large, the creations of inventive, visionary, and often, often eccentric entrepreneurs. It was a fairly unique response to the need for self-promotion in the age of the automobile. And just as a 19th century cobbler put up a sign with a shoe on it for patrons who couldn't read, so the merchant in the 20th century thought he needed a gigantic shoe for motorists driving too fast to read. Just such a merchant was Malin Haynes, the self-described shoe wizard and creator of the Haynes Shoe House in Hallam, Pennsylvania. It overlooks the Lincoln Highway and is a replica of Haynes's best-selling high-top work shoe. It's made of wood with wire lath and a stucco, cement stucco finish, 25 feet tall, 48 feet long. It originally had three bedrooms, two bathrooms, a living room, and a kitchen. And Haynes used it mostly as a promotional tool in a way to share his good fortune with others and get some publicity in the process. He ran a contest for couples celebrating their 50th anniversary and for newlyweds who lived in towns with the Haynes Shoe Store. The lucky winners got a free weekend in the shoe house where they were waited on by a maid, a butler, and the chauffeur. When they left, they got a free pair of shoes. Also along the Lincoln Highway is the coffee pot. It was built in 1927 by David Kuntz in Bedford, Pennsylvania. He built it as a diner and luncheonette next to his gas station. It's 18 feet tall, made of brick with an apartment on the second floor. He covered the exterior with metal sheeting to more closely resemble its namesake kitchen appliance. And it quickly became a popular landmark for road weary travelers. It was the perfect spot to stop, get a bite to eat, a cup of coffee, and fill up with gas. It later became a bar with a hotel attached to it but eventually the Lincoln, that part of the Lincoln Highway was bypassed and the bar struggled and eventually closed. The coffee pot sat empty, languishing in disrepair next to a drive through beer mart. But before it could be demolished, it was sold for a dollar to a Lincoln Highway preservation group who spent $80,000 to restore it. If it were a real coffee pot, it could hold 810,000 cups of coffee. But to enjoy that much coffee, you need a really big donut. And fortunately, there is one, the Donut Hole in La Puente, California. It's been in continuous operation 24 hours a day for 60 years. It consists of two donuts through which patrons drive view freshly baked donuts, place their order, and pick up their bag or box of donuts, all without leaving the car. The building itself is a wood and stucco structure, seemingly cut in half 
and bisected by a paved driveway. The donuts are 26 foot tall, fiberglass, chocolate glazed donuts. And there is a tradition in La Puente for newlyweds to drive through the donut hole shortly after their wedding. For some, it's a symbol of good luck. For others, it's a symbol of something else. Perhaps the most famous iconic structure is the Big Duck, built by Martin Maurer, a successful Long Island duck farmer. On a trip to California, he saw a lot of giant, wildly shaped buildings, and he was determined to make one himself. When he got home, he got a patent, and the duck was hatched. It's it was on the main street in Riverhead, New York, and quickly became the darling of vacationing New Yorkers. Weighs 10 tons, 20 feet by 30 feet, and used Model T taillights for its eyes. It won an award for the most spectacular piece of cement work in 1931. For 50 years, it was a successful poultry store serving processed ducks and duck eggs. You enter through the belly and can exit through a low hanging wooden beam in the back that reads duck, duck, duck. Also inspired by an animal is the big horn built by Michael Kelza in Amato, Arizona. It's a 25 foot tall longhorn steer skull was originally built as a boathouse in bait shop for nearby lakes. But the times and the climate changed and the lakes dried up. But the skull lived on. It's made of rebar, cement, and stucco. And has a 50-foot wingspan from horn tip to horn tip. It's been home to several businesses. It was an Italian restaurant Although the owner said patrons expected steak, it was a Western wire store, a roofing company, and when I shot at a graphic arts facility. It's now the Longhorn Restaurant. It does serve a lot of steak. And apparently all the owners were convinced that patrons wouldn't mind entering through the nasal cavity of a steer skull. One of the few franchised iconic structures is Wigwam Village built in the 1930s by Frank Redford. They were actually teepees, but Redford didn't like the word, so he used wigwam. Consists of 18 poured concrete motel units built in a semicircle around a 32 foot tall, 18 ton big teepee. It served as an office, a cafe, museum, and gift shop. And despite what we now think of as cultural appropriation, his first wigwam village in Cave City, Kentucky was extremely popular. It was often fully booked. For some, it made the journey as exciting as the destination. With its success, Redford built six more, mostly on Route 66. The original one, this one in Holbrook, Arizona, and one in Rialto, California. I'm happy to say I've stayed in all of them. Although the one in California was a bit sketchy when I was there. Round bed, round mirrored ceiling, and a sign on the road that said, do it in the teepee. But it's now restored to its original condition. And despite his flaws, Redford is considered a pioneer in making overnight travel available and affordable to all. And I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about Lucy the Elephant, the largest and oldest iconic structure in America. Lucy is 65 feet tall and weighs in at about 90 tons. She was built in 19, 1881 by James Lafferty. He used about a million pieces of wood and thousands of square feet of tin sheeting. It was built not to sell elephants, but to sell real estate in swampy, undeveloped South Atlantic City, now Margate, New Jersey. 
Lafferty would take potential buyers up to the howdah on top of the elephant, where he could show them parcels of land for sale. They could also see the ocean and the beach and imagine their dream home. Long after Lafferty's time, he was condemned and faced the wrecking ball until a Save Lucy Commission swooped in and rescued her. Today, she's back in business as an Airbnb that just opened and rents for $138 a night in the off season. All these structures serve a dual purpose. They have a utilitarian role in that they sell a product or service, but they're also expressions of individuality, ingenuity, and entrepreneurial prowess. Traits that taken together are uniquely American. And they add richness and diversity to our motorized commercial landscape. It wasn't enough for these entrepreneurs to put up a sign or a modest likeness of their product. They had much bigger things in mind, like Orange World in Kissimmee, Florida, where you can still stop for a snack or send a basket of oranges home to family or friends. At 60 feet tall, it's the biggest orange in the world. And then there's a Gatorland, where you can catch the legends of the Swamp Show with 15 foot gators on a 110 acre theme park, zoo, and nature reserve. It was built by Owen Godwin and opened in 1949 on America's, on Florida's second most traveled highway as tourists were just beginning to travel to Florida. Many of these buildings were extremely successful, but there's also beauty and magic in them. Their simplicity and innocence gives them a unique role in our cultural heritage. And that's it for me. I'd like to turn it back over to Sophie. If I can get out of my pres Thank you. Thank you, Phil. That was great. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, thank you. And I hope everybody who's watching comes to the reception on Saturday. Agreed. All okay. right. Question, when some of the cars in the earlier pictures were real old cars, when did you take these shots? These pictures were taken over a period of probably 30 years. Okay. The most recent ones last year, and the earliest probably in the late 90s. Wow. I see that Helen Jackson has a hand raised. Hey. Yeah. Hi. Um, well, thank you to both of you. I love looking at both these series and I'm looking forward to the show. Um, and I also like the fact that um, the curator did this whole thing on visual history between the two of them, different, but it's that whole thread, it's, it's wonderful. Um, my question is for Jennifer, excuse my dog, you might, you might hear. Uh, my question is for Jennifer. Um, I noticed that some of your images were square and some were rectangular. And I, I've seen your work before and, and quite often you use the square. So how do you feel using a square versus a rectangle? How does it change the, how you, how me, will view something or how it's perceived and what how what part of your artistic process do you change between the two forms of um, image? So well hi thank you for um, your question it's an interesting I was I was recently just asked this uh, a great deal to review I attended um, the square I think when I first fell in love with photography, I, I almost completely bypassed um, 35 millimeter and I kind of just jumped to medium format um, and then large format. And of the medium format, 
uh, that I used, I used two different cameras, uh, a rangefinder and um, a reflex camera that were square format. And I, I liked the square when I started out because uh, in some ways it's more challenging, I feel like to compose within a square because it has really set parameters and you have to really work within that. Um, but I, you know, sort of branched out a little bit in, into the rectangle. I, interestingly, I shoot a lot more verticals. I'm not a horizontal. Uh, I've noticed I just haven't shot a ton of those. Um, but I think it gives you, you know, a different feeling. There's some compositions that I feel like really just sit better, taller, or having that, having a little bit more space. And I would rather shoot it um, in a native format that was that then, I mean, you could always shoot it in, in square and then crop it down, but I have never been a, a person who crops. Um, so yeah, I've just sort of expanded a little bit more to include, um, you know, a taller rectangle. And then traditionally it's sort of ironic being a, a mostly a landscape photographer that I don't shoot in landscape, which would seem like the obvious move. Um, but I don't, I don't have a great deal of longer compositions. I just seems, I guess I'm just more, you know, drawn to taller and I, I still like to shoot the, the square here and there. I think it's a great way when you start shooting to shoot in a square, because it, it limits you in a way that, um, you know, you don't have to kind of make those decisions. You compose within a really a, a set uh, area that gives, you know, it's very democratic in terms of the top is equal to the bottom, the sides are equal to each other. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure if that answers it, but yeah. Yeah, it does. Thank you very much. If we have any other questions from the audience, now is the time. Um, we have some great people uh, in the chat who made some nice comments, uh, Phil and Jennifer, I don't know if you got the chance to see them yet. Um, Sorry, can I ask a, another question then, if that's- Go for it. Phil, it's to you actually. I love seeing all these buildings and a lot of them I've, I've never seen. So while you were shooting these and, and looking at them, did you go into them all? Did you go to the restaurants? Did you, you know, visit each one inside and so so you got the whole sort of experience rather than just seeing them i try to go inside many of them were closed when i shot them they were being renovated um for the tp motels as i mentioned i stayed in all of them um there's a picture of the grand toro um a small diner in the shape of a Bull. And I shot that and the owner was in the picture. And he, of course, insisted that I have a hamburger, which I did. Um, I went up partway in Lucy the Elephant, although it was closed above a certain point for safety reasons. Um, and I did stop at Orange World. I did stop at Gator World. Um, so I did as much as I could. I wish I could have done them all. And I'm looking forward to staying in Lucy the Elephant Airbnb. Perfect. How, how did you discover them? I stumbled on the first couple. And then I started looking for them. And I met the author of a book called California Crazy that documented many of the iconic structures in California and also had a list of everything that author knew about. So I started following that. And there are a couple of organizations. There's the Society for Commercial Archaeology and roadsideamerica.com that had leads to a lot of others. And then friends of mine who knew of places mentioned them. And over the years, I tried to get to as many as I could. I, I have a question for Phil. Are there any that um, have either, you know, there's been this resurgence, is there, is there anything that you would still like to photograph for the series or any, you know, places you haven't been to yet? Oh yeah, there are a bunch. There's a, 
a giant potato that's also on Airbnb in Idaho. There's some milk bottles in Massachusetts that I want to shoot. And there's hat and boots in Seattle, which is a gas station in which the hat is the service station in the boots were the restroom. Cool. I look so forward to that. Cool to see. Thanks for the question. Jennifer, I kind of want to throw that back at you with Hillover. Um, is that a place that you will be going for the rest of your life? And do you see this as a body of work that's just continuing as time goes on? Or how do you see it? I think I'll always be um, photographing that that area. Um, Hillover right now is is such a huge body of work, both both the home um, structure part of it and the the surrounding areas. That right now I'm really in the process of editing it, um, maybe in book form or you know because there's so much work there. It's you know, it's it's wonderful, and I'm excited that it's going to be seen. But the the larger arc of the of the work, as I showed with those little micro series, there's there's a lot more that could be added in, or that gives you kind of a richer experience. So right now, I'm I'm really editing um, what I have, but I I can't see. Uh, I'm sure I'll always photograph out there. I mean, the the light and the beauty of the land. There's you know a reason that there's all of these painters have flocked there, and there's so much wonderful. Um, art that's uh, made out there and artists who are inspired um, by that topography. So I'm sure we'll continue to photograph, but yes, Hillover trying to edit into whatever its next incarnation will be. Awesome. Thank you. And I just saw a question in the chat. Um, there are few references to scale in both the artist's work. Is that by design? So that's in my case, I tried to show scale somewhat. Um, it was difficult in some instances, but I tried to include um, people or cars or street lights or something of that nature to give an idea of what the size was. And Jennifer, I'm not sure about you. What about you? Scale, I mean, I, you know, for the ones that are, are outside, I do try and photograph at different angles. So you get a different point of view. Like there was one of a, um, a food cart that was in Montauk where I was, you know, above it kind of looking down, um, but to give you a sense of, of the space uh, and, you know, where you are, I would say in this series and the other, in, in the series I'm working on now that I just showed a, a snippet of, certainly there's that micro macro thing where I'm coming in very close. So it sort of plays with your perception of, of how large or small something is. But um, yeah, scale is interesting to kind of, you know, pull back and, and present a whole, a whole scene. But yeah, thank you for the question. So Jennifer, you talked a bit about um, what you've been working on these past two years um, since the show was meant to exhibit um and you just mentioned also that uh you're probably you maybe going to cap the the distancing day or in blocks from home um body of work and i just wanted to hear more about um your plans with that and and what you're looking forward to and i'd like to hear that from phil too afterwards so the Visionage series, um, you know, I kept, this isn't the first time I've thought it, it was going to end. And, and when you look at the entire series, there's these little notations on the, on the bottom. So there's some days that are more important than others. So like when the, the first dose of vac the vaccine I put on there and, um, you know, I thought it was winding down post second vax and then we had Omicron and that was sort of a day that was marked when that variant was, was coming in Delta. Um, but now, you know, the, the two, maybe it's just because it was two years seems like such a, a marker. Um, you know, I, I don't know if there might be, you know, whether there will still be uh, anything that gets added to that series, depending on um, variants, knock on wood. Um, but I'm working on a few other series as well as 
Um, I'm working on a series that has to do with my Japanese American family and executive order 9066, in which my Japanese family was interned in Arizona from California. And so that's been a real um, labor of love. It's half uh, ar archival and then half my work that sort of supports it. Um, and I have a, a couple of other offshoot series uh, as well that I'm working on currently. But, um, you know, I don't know if I will ever, I'm sure, you know, the, the, the COVID series, maybe even more than Hillover, will have a hard stopping point at some point. Um, Hillover, because of the location, I can't imagine ever, you know, ending photographing there. But right now, I think sort of editing these other series, um, working on the um, Japanese American series is, you know, that's my main focus next. Nice. And Phil, um, what have you been doing in these last two years? And <laughs> what are you looking forward to? <laughs> I'm looking forward to going back to New Mexico and shooting in the wonderful light of the Southwest. I spent a lot of this time going through old pictures and um, learning Photoshop much better than I knew it before. And I'm anxious to do more work of natural and man-made structures in a mix of natural and artificial light which is what I enjoy doing in architectural detail and in traditional landscapes. That's awesome. Well, I hope you get out west soon. <laughs> Me too. Do you have any trips planned? Um, a trip out to California next month will be the first venture out since COVID. Oh, good. Well, safe travels. I hope that goes well. Thank you. <laughs> Ewan, do you have any um, kind of thoughts after seeing um, this work and, and hearing a bit more about it from the artists? No, I just want to say something, especially this is for everyone else, because I really think you all should come and see the print in person because the colors and everything just looks stunning in person. I'm not saying the, pres the presentation was great, right? But if you see their prints in person, they're absolutely gorgeous. So you all need to come this Saturday. Yes. We'll be there. Saturday, four to six. Refreshments. No snowstorm. <laughs> right. um, I, there was also someone in the chat that said to Phil, so glad you included Lucy the elephant. I was part of Save Lucy fundraiser in high school and was part of the parade to move her back to her new site. So oh, great. <laughs> I'm looking to get back to Lucy. And she is the oldest and largest in the world, in the country, maybe in the world, probably not, <laughs> the country. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody who came out tonight. Thank you, Jennifer and Phil. Round of applause. Um, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you to, to thank Gail, you. And Phil and Sophie and Ewan for your wonderful help editing and curation. And to Tom, who gets an extra shout out because he my the two installations and the prints, it's like 50 works. It's really complicated. They're grids, which are beautiful to see in person that I hope people will see. But he did a, a really wonderful job hanging a kind of complicated show. And both mine and Phil's, I think, looks, you know, really elegant. He did a lovely job. But thank you, guys. Yeah, Jennifer, your stuff looks great. It's a wonderful installation. Same. Yeah. I love, love being partners. <laughs> awesome. Well, everybody enjoy the rest of your night and thank you again for coming and we'll hopefully see you on Saturday. Yes. Bye everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.